Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for attending today's presentation. My name is Jacob Washington, and I'm the president of the Milwaukee Center for Jesse Ogobian is an activist, a public speaker, and a contributing author. He's also, he also teaches history and is the co-advisor of the Black Student Union at Garfield High School, the site of the historic boycott of the MAP test in 2013. Jesse is an associate editor for the social justice periodical Rethinking Schools and is the editor of More Than a Score, The New Uprising Against High Stakes Testing. He is a founding member of Social Equality Educators, a recipient of the 2012 Abe Kelly Foundation Award for Excellence and in Innovation in Peace Education, won the 2013 Secondary School Teacher of the Year Award, and the Special Achievement Courageous Leadership Award from the Academy of Education and Arts Sciences. In 2015, Jesse received the Seattle King County NAACP Service Award, was named as an Education Fellow to the Progressive Magazine, as well as a Cultural Freedom Fellow for the Lannan Foundation for his nationally recognized work in promoting critical thinking and opposing high stakes testing. John Young, a writer for a writer and contributor to the Austin Statesman has said that Jesse is doing more than teaching history. He's answering history's call. And now, with a warm round of applause, please welcome to the stage Mr. Jesse. Good morning, everyone. Hey, it's so great to be with you all here today. Thank you, Seattle Central, for the invitation. Thank you to uh, Marion for helping set this all up, and to the Black Student Union for your help with this and that, that beautiful um, introduction. Um, and it's really wonderful to see a few of my students in the, in the mix. Where else? Oh, look, Masami's here too. Who else? Anyone else I've had? Um, it's great to have you all here. Come on in. It's an important time that we gather together today to talk about this struggle for social justice um, and this struggle to transform education to make it part of the fight for social justice because you know what's happening tomorrow we're getting we're about to have the overseer of the school to prison pipeline come visit our town right uh, education secretary betsy devos is flying in town and you know one of the most reviled members of the trump administration is going to come here and give a speech at the Hyatt Regency in Bellevue tomorrow. Um, if you all have an extra $350 lying around, you can go sit in and, and have dinner with her even. I'm not expecting I'll probably see a lot of you at the dinner table with her, but um, you should come show up and rally with me because there's going to be thousands of people surrounding that hotel, letting her know what we think of her, and we won't exactly be rolling out the red carpet. Um, but I want to read to you a letter that I wrote, an open letter to Betsy DeVos that was published in the Progressive Magazine yesterday um, about why we're, why we're going to do this uh, and why we're protesting her presence here in Seattle. And uh, so it starts like this. Dear... Secretary DeVos. My name is Jesse Hagopian. I teach ethnic studies at Seattle's Garfield High School. I hope you didn't just stop reading this letter after you heard the subject I'm teaching. I urge you to keep reading. I'm writing in regards to the Washington Policy Center's $350 a person fundraising dinner you will be addressing on October 13th. Thousands of my colleagues will be surrounding the building to make sure the world knows your message of division is not welcome here. Given your recent protests of, uh, given the recent protests of speeches that you've given at Harvard, at the historically black Bethune Cookman University, and many other places, you might be getting used to this by now. Um, but just so there's no surprises, let me tell you what to expect. There will be bullhorns. There will be signs and speeches, and I bet some of the more creative teachers, maybe the art teachers, at least the ones that are left after your budget cuts, 
uh, will show up in grizzly bear costumes referencing the asinine comments you made defending the use of guns in school to quote, protect from potential grizzlies. <laughs> Amazing. There will be students there questioning your qualifications to serve as Secretary of Education given that they have more experience in the public schools than you do. They might point out that you never attended public schools and neither did any of your four children. There will be black people there and civil rights organizations because you refused to say if, fe if the federal government would bar funding from private schools that discriminate. And these anti-racist activists will protest your claim that historically black colleges and universities are, quote, pioneers of choice as a way to promote privatizing public education, as if black people founding these colleges did so out of some great choice rather than systematic segregation that existed in, in our country. There will be feminists there protesting your outrageous dismantling of Title IX protections aimed at reducing sexual assault on campuses. Your decision to meet with sexist so-called men's rights groups to decide on your approach to Title IX policy shows just how little regard you have for protecting victims of sexual assault. As Mara Kessling, the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality said recently, she's meeting with groups and individuals today who believe that sexual assault is some sort of feminist plot to hurt men. There will be transgender people and others in the LGBTQ community protesting your decision with Attorney General Jeff Sessions to pull back public school guidelines allowing transgender students to use bathrooms for the gender they identify with. And while you have stated you don't support gay conversion therapy, according to the Washington Post, you served from 2001 to 2013 as the vice president of the Edgar and Elsa Prince Foundation, which donated to anti-LGBTQ groups that do. College students will join us in protest because of your attempt to stop debt collection regulations meant to protect students from predatory colleges. The borrower defense repayment rules implemented under President Obama make it easier for defrauded student loan borrowers to obtain debt forgiveness. In addition, union educators and members will join the rally because of your unrelenting attack on organized labor. As Mother Jones Magazine wrote of your plan to push the anti-union so-called right to work legislation, they said, these laws outlaw contracts that require all employees in unionized workplaces to pay dues for union representation. Back in 2007, such a proposal in the union heavy state of Michigan was considered a right wing fantasy, but thanks to DeVos's aggressive strategy and funding, the bill became law by 2012. Now, to be fair, I want to acknowledge that the destruction of the public education system didn't begin with you when your predecessor, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, came to town. Uh, we protested him as well. Like you, he was also committed to privatizing education. He just didn't have your zeal for the voucher approach. But Duncan was even more motivated than you to reduce an individual student's intellectual and emotional learning to a single number on a test that could be used to punish a child, a teacher, or an entire school. To truly transform our public education system so it empowers students to be critical thinkers and change makers, we must go far beyond removing you from office. To achieve the schools our children deserve, it will require a mass grassroots uprising of educators, students, parents, unions, working people, poor, LGBTQ folks, women, people of color, and human rights organizations who are ultimately empowered to democratically run their own school systems. Thankfully, all those people will be at the rally tomorrow, so maybe we can begin that conversation. See you in a few days. Sincerely, Jesse Hagopian. <laughs>
So I don't know if she's going to read that before the rally, but she's going to get the message when she tries to get into the hotel tomorrow. And uh, if you all want to join us there, you're welcome to come lend your voice uh, to the struggle. And I think it's urgent that we do so for all of those struggles that I, that I talked about. And I think we are in a really important moment in history where it's incumbent upon us to build the biggest possible resistance to everything that Donald Trump stands for. And you know, he uh, emblazons his name on everything he owns, right? You have the Trump hotels, the Trump towers, the Trump golf course, the Trump university, what, uh, what else does he have? And that name that's synonymous with bigotry and sexual assault and racism and homophobia is out and proud everywhere, right? And I think it's time that we emblazon our values on our public institutions, rejecting the things that he stands for. And that's why I was so inspired when I saw what Lowell Elementary School did, right? Let's go ahead and say what we want in our schools. We want our black students' lives to matter here, right? Let's, let's go ahead and say we reject sexual assault on this campus and we won't tolerate it here, right? Let's go em emblazon on our school reader boards, immigrants are welcome here, right? Um, we will disrupt the school to prison pipeline and embrace restorative justice, right? Let's put that, uh, those values out for everyone in our community uh, to see and appreciate. Um, and I think that disrupting the school to prison pipeline is one of the, the most urgent challenges that we have in our society today um, that's so marked by mass incarceration, right? There are now more black people behind bars or on probation or parole in the correctional system than were slaves on plantations in 1850, right? That, you have to let that sink in for a moment when you hear these platitudes about the greatest nation on earth and the greatest democracy of all time and we have more people being caged, more black people being caged than were, than were slaves. Uh, that should give you a sense of how much freedom that we have and we should know that the school system is part of fueling that explosion in the prison population. And what do I mean by that? How does that work here in liberal progressive Seattle and Washington State? Well, I think you could begin with a state budget that's criminal. And when I use the word criminal, that's actually not just in the moral sense, it's in the technical legal sense, right? Our state legislature has been found guilty of failing to fund the public school system, not by my estimation, by the state Supreme Court that's ruled over and over again that they are failing the paramount duty, as it says in the Washington State Constitution, the paramount duty of the state is to fully fund education. And yet our state is notorious for giving away billions of dollars to the wealthy and tax breaks and refusing to give uh, the basic education that our students deserve. So was it 87 billion in tax breaks to Boeing, uh, hundreds of millions in tax loopholes for Amazon and Microsoft and all the huge corporations, no income tax, one of the few states in the entire nation to have no income tax. So we actually in Washington state have the most regressive tax system of all 50 states. We're the last. <laughs> and this, you know, you can you can talk about the south and how backwards they are if you want, but we are the worst state in the entire nation when it comes uh, to tax fairness. So we tax the wealthy the least and we tax the poor the most. That's an obscenity. Uh, that's actually been shown now by the state Supreme Court to be illegal, but they continue to do it. Now, if my students go out and right, steal something from the corner store because they're hungry, they'll end up in, with a jail sentence. 
But if the state supreme, but if the state legislature breaks not just some little law, but the highest law of our land, the paramount duty of our state, they walk around free, get uh, actually, you know, being wined and dined by lobbyists, and everything is fine. That's the basic situation that we have set up in our state, and it's contributing to a school to prison pipeline when you don't fully fund the the programs that our kids deserve when they don't have the after school programs the tutoring services the trauma counseling the college counseling services the smaller class size all the things that we need to educate our kids to give them a bright future um, are being systematically stolen from us right that is how the machinery of the school to prison pipeline is laid and then you can see it more acutely right here in Seattle and in King County because of the construction of the new youth jail. Have you guys been following that? Have you seen that in the news? People protesting against it. Other people saying, well, we just have to have it. Um, you should know it's a $200 million facility, probably end up being a lot more than that, right? Imagine what we could do with $200 million to support our kids in the public school system, uh, to help them get somewhere other than that youth jail, right? And so that is the financial priorities of our state, of our city, of, of our county, um, that would rather build uh, spaces to warehouse our youth than to nurture them and support them. Uh, and. I think, though, if we really want to understand the school to prison pipeline, we have to go right into the classroom and look at what's being taught in these classrooms. Because I think a lot of times when kids are being um, pushed out of school, right? when I talk about the school to prison pipeline, it's about kids getting pushed out of school, they, they're suspended, expelled, then they're not graduating, then they don't have a diploma so they can't get a good job then they end up doing petty crimes that end up in prison right and a lot of times that starts with disruptive behavior in the classroom right and those kids get labeled as defiant and pushed out but I think maybe that it's better understood as kids who are disrupting uh, actually racist curriculum curriculum that that hides the struggles and contributions of people of color. And why would you sit there and listen to that, right? That piece gets overlooked. And I wanna give you a couple examples so you can see how systematic the erasure of, of um, the contributions and struggles of people of color are. So this is an example. Um, this is an example from uh, from Texas that happened two years ago. Um, and I'm gonna show you one more example. Um, this uh, student, freshman in high school was, opened up his book to the page his teacher told him to and read a passage about slavery. And let's see what he learned. Phaedra Publishing Company is apologizing to a local mother about how that company portrayed slavery in a book used by local students. I went to news reporter Caitlin McCulley is live at Pearland High School tonight to show us what that mother found in the textbook and what the publisher is promising to do about it. Caitlin? Hey Tom, a ninth grader here at Pearland High School opened up his textbook to read a passage about immigration. What he found was pretty shocking to him and his mother. So he has a copy of the book at home. Ronnie Dean Burren shared this cell phone video on social media. This is a part of the Texas textbook adoption. After her son, Kobe, texted her about an alarming passage in his textbook. About Africans coming over as workers. Kobe sent her this image, which reads, The Atlantic slave trade between the 1500s and the 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. That map is under a section heading called Patterns of Immigration. Immigrants. Immigrants. Yeah. That, that word matters. In the next section, the text mentions English and European people. Many of whom came as indentured servants to work for little or no pay. So they say that about um, English and European people, but there is no mention of Africans working as slaves or being slaves. It just says we were 
workers. Dean Byrne contacted the publisher, McGraw-Hill, to express her concerns. The company responded on Facebook, saying in part, we conducted a close review of the content and agreed that our language in that caption did not adequately convey that Africans were both forced into migration and to labor against their will as slaves. We believe we can do better. Yeah, we believe we can do better than just lying. <laughs> You have, yeah, I mean, I laugh, but it's really, it's, I laugh because it's so uncomfortable and it's so horrific what that teaches our youth, right? And it's not just, they, they said they apologize and they're going to change the wording, but there's a problem. Let's say they change the wording. There's a bigger problem. <clears throat> Did you notice the section they put slavery in? Well, I have a couple students I've shown this two already. I've I show, had to show this video in my class, right? What You guys remember what section they put uh, this slavery in? Immigration. Yes, immigration. <clears throat> so black people were just immigrating here, looking for a better life. That's why we, did we just chain ourselves to the bottom of slave ships to come over here looking for a better life? I mean, it's outrageous that they put... <laughs> The Atlantic slave trade, one of the great crimes in human history in the section on patterns of immigration. And then, so that's, okay, well that, let's say, let's write that off. That's the South, even though Texas, the Texas textbook adoption is what ends up sweeping the country. Um, and these McGraw-Hill textbooks get used all over the country, right? But let's just say, okay, well that's, that's the South. Well, let's take a look at what happened in Connecticut. This is last year. This book, this textbook had been used for many, many years in, in Connecticut. The Connecticut Adventure. Looks like a nice normal textbook. Uh, compared to other colonies, Connecticut did not have many slaves. Some people owned one or two slaves. They often cared for and protected them like members of the family. Wow. So you, you whip your own family members, you sell them off, you split up mothers and, and daughters and children. I mean, can you, can you see why students who check out of a class like that are defying racism? rather than just being defiant. Um, take a look at this. I want you to see what this is training fourth graders to think. This is, <clears throat> this mother found this worksheet from her daughter at school. Look what it says. Slaves were treated badly, okay, how were the slaves treated in Connecticut? She wrote, slaves were treated badly and cruelly, and then she crossed it out because she read the textbook. And she wrote, slaves were treated like members of the family. Right? This is what's happening in our classrooms around the country. Right? This isn't like it's one classroom here or there. It's institutionalized in the textbooks that are being distributed in classrooms all across the country um, that downplay uh, the crimes against people of color and uh, that really erase the, the struggles and contributions. Um, and so there are several things that I've been trying to work on to help disrupt the school to prison pipeline that I want to share with you guys and get your feedback and opinions and see how, where you might fit into the struggle and how you might be able to, to further the struggle in your own work in, in your own campus um, as part of what I think is such an important um, important social justice movement because you know myself um, in 2015 I was giving the last speech at the Martin Luther King rally downtown and a few moments later I was pepper sprayed in the face by the Seattle Police Department. I was just on the phone with my mom trying to coordinate a ride to my son's two-year-old birthday party. And, you know, right when I started talking to her, I got this hot 
um, blast of pepper spray in my face that just seared my eyes and my inner ear and you know it was a really painful experience but it was a lot worse because when I got to my son's birthday party instead of being able to enjoy it I was you know traumatizing my kids who were worried about what happened and I couldn't didn't really want to explain to them the whole thing about the police state yet <laughs> right and so it was a really difficult time and then I launched a federal lawsuit against the Seattle Police Department and ultimately they settled with me and I used the funds from that settlement to start the Black Education Matters Student Activist Award. So every year I've given out thousand dollar awards to student activists who are disrupting the school to prison pipeline, who are fighting against institutional racism um, and building struggles for social justice. Um, this past year, actually, Michael Bennett from the Seattle Seahawks joined in um, and partnered with me on that and gave an award to a student um, at Chief South High School. And it's been a really um, important way to help uh, celebrate and uplift students who are doing this work and fighting back um, against racism in their society and in their schools. Um, another thing that I've been really dedicated to helping build is what we call the Black Lives Matter at School movement. And it started, I want to tell you the story of how it started and, and where it's going to talk about um, how we we can even partner on this and bring it here. But it began last year when an elementary school wanted to celebrate the black students' lives on their campus. It was John Muir Elementary um, in the Mount Baker neighborhood here in Seattle. And there was a group called Black Men United to change the narrative, and they were partnering with the teachers, and they were all gonna be out front of the school high-fiving the youth as they come in the building and then holding discussions throughout the day about race and diversity. And the art teacher designed a beautiful shirt that said, Black Lives Matter, we stand together with this tree uh, in the middle. And the teachers are gonna wear those to welcome the students into school that day. But it got leaked to the media, and then some right-wing websites, and, and then Blue Lives Matter picked it up and then floods of hate mail streamed into the school and the school district and then some really hateful person made a bomb threat on an elementary school for the audacity of the teachers to wear shirts that validate their black students lives and so the school district officially canceled the event but it went off anyway because the the educators and the community members came together and went forward with the action. Now it was smaller than it would have been without the threat. But I said, you know, we got to do something to support this school and show that we're not just going to be intimidated by uh, these hateful racist extremists. And what if we organized it so every school did it? They can't threaten every school all at once. Right? And so we put forward a resolution in our union calling on teachers to wear Black Lives Matter shirts to school on October 19th last year and to teach anti-racist lessons in the classroom that day, making it Black Lives Matter a school day. And I thought, you know, maybe a few dozen teachers would participate in this and it would be a great start. And then the orders for the shirts just came flooding in hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds and on that day over 3,000 Seattle educators put on one of those shirts and hundreds of educators that day taught lessons about the school to prison pipeline and the Black Lives Matter movement and it was a huge victory I think for for Seattle's uh, public school students. Thank you. few of the students here were there for that day. We had a rally on the front steps and schools all across Seattle um, took pictures. Let me show you what it looked like. Um, there it is. Here's some of the schools that participated. I mean, every school participated, but here's a few of the pictures. You know, Thornton Creek Elementary School, Queen Anne, um, Hawthorne, 
Garfield, Dearborn Park, Aki Kurose, Leshai, um, <clears throat> Cascadia, all these teachers proudly celebrating their students' lives. And then it spread beyond Seattle because the teachers in Philadelphia saw what we did and they started the Black Lives Matter at school movement and then to Rochester, New York. And now this year, we've actually called for a national debt week of action, Black Lives Matter at school that was likely, it's being organized right now. I was just on a conference call with teachers from Philly, New York City, New Jersey, Detroit, Baltimore, um, several other places to coordinate a national uh, week of action where we highlight different aspects of black identity throughout the week. So we can talk about um, the struggles of black women, right? We can talk about the struggles of LGBTQ black folks, where we can talk about the struggles of immigrant black folks, right? And how those, um, those struggles are similar and unique and how we have to take up an intersectional approach to fighting oppression if we're really truly going to get free. Um, collectively and that's the goals of this this week of action that that we have planned coming up and I hope um, as it gains momentum and as you see it in the uh, in social media and the news that you know folks on college campuses and schools around the area will join join this struggle um, and use it <clears throat> to, to help push back against the injustices we're seeing um, and one of the important things that we did in this struggle is we added something to the original shirts that said Black Lives Matter, we stand together. We added the, the hashtag say her name to the shirts because all too often the violence against black men gets elevated above the violence that's happening to black women. And we actually know in, in this, the school discipline data that it's actually black girls that are most disproportionately suspended across the country. And we know from cases like Sandra Bland um, that state violence against uh, black women and also transgender people is, is very real and you know extremely disproportionate. And when we added that phrase in last October, hashtag say her name to highlight the state violence against women, we didn't know just how important that would be because then at the end of the school year, a horrific event occurred, which was the killing of Charlena Lyles. People know that story? So Charlena Lyles lived in the Sandpoint neighborhood up north a black woman, mother of four, pregnant woman. She believed someone was breaking into her apartment and so she called the police for help. And the police show up and within minutes of their arrival, they shot her down in a hail of seven, seven bullets. And it was incredibly difficult experience uh, for uh, my students to process and for us all to realize that this struggle isn't just about Ferguson, right, or um, all the other places we've seen. This is right here in our own city. And, you know, she was killed in front of three of her kids. And so I was really moved by the fact that we were able to get the teachers who had started this movement to realize it wasn't just about wearing a shirt one day in October, that we actually need to take action because the, the story that was spun in the media was that Charlena Lyles was mentally unstable, that she was a criminal, right? That she had a criminal background. So they try to not just kill her, but then assassinate her character to make her seem like she's not one of us. She's so different from you, you can just accept her death. But what we did is organize the teachers to come to school within 24 hours of her killing to wear the shirts again in solidarity. And that helped change the narrative in the news that actually she's embraced by Seattle's educators, by Seattle's families, that she's a parent of Seattle Public School children. 
um, and that um, her, her life has great value in our community, right? And that was something that I was incredibly proud of helping to, to organize uh, in, in this long struggle that we have um, for, for justice. So I want to um, end on just uh, a last thought and then take some time for questions and see um, how we can make this, this struggle real and relevant for you all here. Because I think that um, schools are a really important place to bring the fight for social justice because they're such contradictory spaces in a way. On the one hand, the, uh, those in power, Trump and Secretary DeVos and the richest 1% in our, in our nation, see the schools as a way to discipline you all, right? To teach you the values of our society that neatly integrate you into a dramatically unequal society, right? We have five people in the world today that have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people, right? You have five human beings that have more wealth than half the planet. And that is a basic contradiction that creates all sorts of human calamity, whether it's around health, education, and, and our societies that just aren't taking care of people because the wealth is being hoarded at the top. And they use the public education system as a way to maintain their power and their place. And what do I mean by that? I think there's actually, well, two ways they, they maintain power. One is through just outright brute force, right? So when we organize for justice, you can see the way they disrupt that, right? When the Occupy movement rose up to show that the 1% has too much wealth, they just brought in police forces and cleared out the encampments all over the country. Um, they brutalized marches for black lives all the time, right? But they'd rather not rely on that method of control because then it's constant disruption to the normal functioning of society. They'd rather just train you to believe you're in your right place and that our society is just and there's freedom for all because then you won't even question, right? So that's the role of ideology and the public school system, I think, that's very dangerous, right? And they can do that through many different ways. Um, a social studies curriculum that erases the crimes against black people and other, and other folks. They can do it through standardized testing, where, like for myself, I was a very bad test taker, and I knew that I wasn't intelligent, and you know, I could accept that I wouldn't go very far because I didn't stack up well to those who were doing well on the test, right? So now you internalize a lack of self-worth. And that is perhaps their greatest way of controlling society, have you believe that you're meant for that low-wage job, right? And they're supposed to do well because they did well on the test and now they can run society. <laughs> So if you set up a school system to help indoctrinate kids to believe that this great inequality is natural and normal, that's the best way to, to continue to reproduce inequality generation after generation. But schools do something else though. They don't just reinforce that inequality. They also say, we also know that there's this message that schools can be places to help you unlock human potential and realize your full self and learn and question, right? And so there's that tension in every school around what the purpose is gonna be. And that tension creates explosions like happened in the 1960s and 70s when whole campuses were occupied by youth demanding ethnic studies programs, black studies programs, um, and com changes in curriculum to empower our, our youth, right? And I think we're beginning to see the potential for that kind of um, student activism again and coupled with educators who want to empower students to, to transform um, their society and I think that now those contradictions are really coming to a head when they tell us school is about freedom and human uh, potential and then you see Betsy DeVos cutting the funds um, and restricting 
so much. Uh, I think we're beginning to enter a period where there's great potential for another eruption of social movements like we haven't seen since, the, since my parents' generation built the black freedom struggles and, and the other struggles for, for liberation. So I just want to end by reading a quote from this book, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. It's written by a woman named Kianga Yamada Taylor. I highly recommend it. If you haven't had a chance to read this book, I think it's one of the most important books about the struggle for racial equality. And she says, quote, the Black Lives Matter movement from Ferguson to today has created a feeling of pride and combativeness among a generation that this country has tried to kill, imprison, and simply disappear. The power of protest has been validated. For it to become more, even more effective, to affect the policing state and to withstand opposition and attempts to infiltrate, subvert, and undermine what has been built, there must be more organization and coordination in the move from protest to a movement. And I think that's the, the challenge that faces us today. So thank you for having me here to, to begin this conversation. Thanks for being here. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, for tomorrow, what time and where? Yeah, so it is uh, 5 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Bellevue. Um, and you can, you can just Google Betsy DeVos protest Bellevue and uh, get, get the specifics. Yep. Yeah, hope to see you there. Other folks have questions? Yeah. So I guess I want to start off before I ask my question by saying that I, I loved your talk. Um, I think there's a lot of problems with the school system, whether that's curriculum or discipline or funny teachers. And I, I think you're a great role model, especially for a lot of black students at Garfield. I Thank you. went to Garfield for two years. Right on. But I think when mentioning some of these issues, I think you failed, or sorry, failed is the wrong word. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Go ahead. Uh, I suppose it would be worth mentioning some of the issues that arise culturally, especially in the black community, when it comes to encouraging success. Um, I know, for instance, that there's a 72% rate of single motherhood in the black community. So when you're a, a kid in a home life like that, it's really difficult to feel encouraged to succeed. And I know teachers play a big role in that. But what do you think can be done, especially within the black community, to encourage like positive home life and making sure that kids feel supported at home? Yeah, so I think that question really reflects um, what I've been teaching students in my class called the master narrative, because there's all kinds of narratives out there that um, help people understand oppression in terms of individual failure, right? Because in order to reproduce the type of racism and institutional um, discrimination and inequality that exists, you have to convince people that it's their own fault for the situations that they, they're ending up in. Um, and otherwise, they begin to organize and rebel against a social system that's dramatically unequal. And so I think that uh, that question about, you know, black mothers, single mothers, uh, and families being split apart as the problem of, of black kids and black society, um, misses a few really important points. Um, but I'm glad you raised it because it's something that we have to confront head on and have a very clear answer for if we're going to be able to, to end the school to prison pipeline and the mass incarceration. And when, when, that, when that stat and the, that um, narrative gets rolled out that, that it's black families' fault for the state of black America, what that misses is where are those black dads, right? Where are they? Yeah, they're behind bars. They're being warehoused and caged. Now why? Are they more criminal? Are they more criminally active? Well, this country for a long time had a pretty stable prison population, right? And then all of a sudden, in the late 70s and 80s, the prison population exploded. Did black people all of a sudden become degenerates in, in those few years? Or was there systematic policy that ripped black families apart, right? Either you have to say there's something wrong with the psychology of black people, 
that suddenly, just suddenly took hold, right? And then they became bad people that needed to be put behind bars. Or you have to say there's something wrong with the social policy in this country that destroyed black communities, right? And namely the war on drugs. That really isn't a war on drugs. It's been a war on black communities, and that's been demonstrated over and over and over again. But it's clearly shown by the, by the numbers of, black, uh, of drug use, right? So you can look at white and black community drug use. And this has been shown by study after study after study. You can read about it famously in the book, The New, the, um, New Jim Crow. But black and white drug use rates are the same in America. Right? If you want to find people using drugs, where should you go? You go uh, to black communities? Well, maybe, but you could find them higher rates of drug use on college campuses, right? I mean, all across this country, if you want to be sure to find people using drugs, go into the dorms, right, at four-year universities, and you will find criminals, <laughs> according to this system, criminals, but our black uh, but, but our police, right, in the dorms, cracking heads and dragging out white uh, affluent college students? Absolutely not. That's not who's been criminalized, right? So black families have been criminalized they, because there's over-policing in those neighborhoods. And then the sentencing policies have been shown over and over and over again to be racially biased. So that when, a, when black people get sentenced for the exact same amount of drugs being held, black people get higher sentences on average, right? And so what that does is it rips apart black families. So instead of the problem being black men just not caring about their children, right? We see that we in the United States have the highest prison population in world history. So we're told that this is the greatest democracy on earth. This is the, the wonderful freedoms but in fact, right, the Russian gulags couldn't lock up as many people as we do in the United States. China, right, how many, the population of China, you know, dwarfs our population, and yet we have more prisoners than China does, right? So we have this explosion in the prison population that's ripped apart black families, and then we put the blame on black men or black women for not raising their families right. And I think we instead need to, to look at the social system and a war on drugs and the sentencing policies and a whole lot of other um, unequal uh, arrangements in our society that have contributed to that, uh, um, to that dramatic institutional racism in our society. Yeah, does that make sense? I just wanted to add to that, um, you know, opioid uh, use is a very serious problem in this country now, right? But it's mostly in the white community, and if you abuse opioids, right, you know, prescription drugs, right, you get, the sent, you get sent to counseling, right? right. There's all this effort to get counseling for opiate drug users, but if you sell $10 worth of crack, you end up in prison for five years. Right. You know, that, that's, that, that's criminal. That's absolutely criminal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, the war on drugs is so racialized. Um, and of course it can't be explained like that in schools. If, if in school you learned about the fact that white and black people use drugs at the same rate, but black people are put in prison at much higher rates, if that was in the media and school, constantly, then we would, there would be movements erupting to fight back against this. So you can't be taught this. Otherwise, we would have a different society, and those in power wouldn't have so much power. So you have to be taught a different narrative, that, it, that it, it's our own fault for these problems. Otherwise, movements erupt. And yet, people are beginning to learn this anyway, and are beginning to organize and fight back. And that's what gives me great hope that with all the power and access to media, um, you know, young people are figuring this out and beginning to organize and fight back anyway. Any other questions? I'd love, we got time for one more? Okay. Sir, go ahead. Well, I went to Franklin, how long have you been at Garfield? 
Uh, from about 2010, I, I was a student at Garfield, so I feel like I've been there my whole life. <laughs> uh, but then I came back to, to start teaching there about 2010. Yeah. Yeah, another question? No, I just wanted to emphasize, <clears throat> excuse me, emphasize your point. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, because we have, right? We're, we have to. The way they maintain their their inequality is to tell you that the problem isn't the the billionaires and the folks um, hoarding the wealth. The problem is the immigrant, the um, Muslim, you know, the the black criminal, and you know, get us blaming each other to divide and conquer, right? And you, there's so many examples of the disparity of the way. That communities are treated the way police are able to de-escalate folks like Dylan Roof who shot up a whole church right but then was just arrested and handcuffed versus black people who uh, get pulled over for a tail light and then you know get get actually shot and killed um, the disparities are all all through the system let alone looking at like the bankers who sabotage the global economy with exotic financial in instruments like um, adjustable rate mortgages and collateralized debt obligations and then we bailed them out with hundreds of trillions, <laughs> billions of dollars, trillions of dollars in taxpayer money. Those people are lauded as the high people in society, right? But they're actually criminals. But And then black people are labeled criminals in our society. So the disparities are, are rife and it, I think we have to start rethinking the way our society is set up and, and envision a, a better future that's about empowering our youth um, to, to fulfill their needs and to create a socially just society. So thanks for engaging me in this conversation today. I mean,